On February 6, 2023, a 7.6 earthquake struck Turkey and Syria, killing nearly 60,000 people in Turkey, 9,000 in Syria. Who was there to save the animals? The woman who headed up the rescue team from PETA joins me next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights, brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, within days of an earthquake hitting Turkey and Syria, thanks to PETA's Global Compassion Fund, PETA sent out a small rescue team to help save as many companion animals that they could. Led by Mimi Bekshi, Vice President of PETA UK, Europe and Australia, the team spent a month in Turkey and worked remotely with vets in Syria to help animals there. In my conversation with Bekshi, she described the devastation she saw and how they came to save hundreds of animals. There were cats like Thalia, who was found with a broken pelvis, another named Lucky, who now has a new home, and then there's Baloo, who was rescued and united with his 16-year-old companion. The happy stories of a tragedy that continues even when you don't see it on the news. My conversation with Mimi Bekshi on PETA's effort to save the animals after the earthquake in Turkey and Syria on the PETA podcast. Mimi, thanks for being with us. It's been a while. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> has, yeah. Usually you're disrupting dog shows and... <laughs> And now you're you're trying to save a save entire countries from the ravages of earthquakes. So well, we do what we can. <laughs> I know. Well, I wanted to get you on soon because with every day it seems like the earthquake passes. You know, just you know, moves on is no longer mm-hmm. news. Get you know, is kind of wiped off the uh, the mindset, the news mindset of editors and people who talk about things happening in the world, but, Mm -hmm. but the need's still there, right? I mean, it doesn't go away. Oh, massively. Um, You know, the country, Turkey, where we were working is parts of that country have just been utterly devastated. Whole cities have just been raised to the ground. And, you know, the areas where we were working, um, Elbistan and Marash and Antakya, where they were really the epicenter of the earthquake. We were there for over a month. There's so much need still there. The animals that are still there have are desperate. You know, we're, it's not the same situation at the beginning when we started, where it was a race against time to get animals that were still trapped in buildings out. Um, that was the first few weeks where we were, you know, receiving reports literally every minute of, you know, three cats in an apartment on the fifth floor over here, um, dog with a broken leg over here. Um, now it's more a case of. It, the bulldozers are coming in. They're tearing down what's left of any of the buildings that are still partially standing in order to rebuild. And we have so many cats there that are still um, trying to survive on the streets. But um, a lot of them now, because it's, you know, they're in heat, it's the spring, and um, they're looking for safe places to have their babies. And they're going into these derelict buildings, you know, into basements and things where they think that that's going to be a safe place, but they don't realize, of course, that the bulldozers are about to come in and, and just wipe out the rest of what's what, what remains. Uh, so it's a really risky place for them. So the last time that we were there um, earlier this month, what we were doing really in Antakya was trying to trap as many of those cats as possible um, and take them out of that really dangerous place. Um, and, you know, um, make sure that they are able to have their babies safely. And uh, and we were taking them to the clinics in Antakya. A lot of them have been moved to partner clinics in Istanbul now as well. We still have over a hundred animals, I think, in our care between the two clinics that we've been working with in Adana, which is a couple of hours away, and then Istanbul, which is 10 hours away, um, caring for many of our animals, all of them traumatized and have had injuries, illnesses, and are, yes, we're still taking care of them and trying to work with partner organizations to get as many animals out of Antakya as we can. It's really incredible, though, what you're saying, that there are still some cats who have survived all this time. It's been Mm -hmm. about, what, two months? 
Yeah, um, it, it has. And, you know, it, it's incredible some of the stories that we're still part of where these are cats who some of them, of course, were, were stray cats that were living on the streets and already struggling to survive. But many of them are people's companion animals who um, are so miraculously alive. And, you know, we've had so many beautiful stories. I think of one cat, his name was Balu, and we found him wandering on the streets. He was obviously starving. We caught him. We brought him back to the vet in Adena that evening. I think we got back to the vet around 11 o'clock at night. They're very long days because we were staying in an area in a city called Adena, which is about a two and a half hour drive away from Antakya because you can't stay in Antakya. There's nothing there. So um, we were starting at seven o'clock in the morning and not getting back to the vets until about 11 o'clock at night. That day we had Balul with us. And um, first thing we do, of course, is check for microchips. And he was microchipped, which is wonderful because we were then able to contact his family and um, they were staying just an hour away. Turns out that his guardian is a 16 year old girl called Elif. She was in um, a building with her grandparents when the building collapsed, both of her grandparents died um, and she was trapped in the rubble for 36 hours before her father and her uncle were able to dig her out. Um, And she had never lost hope that she was going to find Balul again. And it had been weeks by the time that we found him. And they came immediately to the vet. I, so I think they got there at, you know, half past 12 at night or something. And it was just the most beautiful reunion to see them back together again. And she was just so happy to have him. She, they've lost everything. Um, but that moment of being able to be reunited again with Balul was, um, was really pretty magical. There's all these stories. I mean, that's a special story. And as you're saying that, I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, what do these cats have to go through to survive? I mean, mm-hmm. they're out there. I guess you forage among the rubble for whatever you're, you're I guess, you know, food for, for water. I mean, how do they mm-hmm. do it? The people in Turkey are incredibly um, loving towards animals, which was actually such a beautiful thing to see because you would see food on the streets, you know? Um, so people are putting out food for them, but of course there's not enough food and there's many, many animals, but um, they, they are, they're somehow surviving. I mean, a lot of them are not sadly, but um, it's not just the animals on the streets there, you know, so much of the work at the beginning was trying to get animals out of buildings before, you know, when the, the clock was really ticking when they were trapped inside buildings. So we were working with, um, you know, sometimes we'd get a story of cats in the um, fourth floor of a of a building, and there was no way of getting into that building except using a crane. So we were able to rent a crane, get in through the balcony, get to the animals that way. You rented a crane to save an yes. animal? I mean, yes. a lot of people just think, oh, well, Pete is going to go off to the earthquake zone and they're just going to like, you know, like you know, like go go after the low hanging fruit, the 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 dogs no. and the cats that are out there. But you rented a crane. Yes, we rented a crane. Um, and in the situations where we weren't able to get the crane to the buildings, we were still with the reports of animals in seventh store, you know, seven story apartments. Um, we were having to crawl up crumbling stairwells up to the seventh floor. Uh, we had one report where there were three cats that were trapped inside a fourth floor apartment building. We managed to get up to the fourth floor by, you know, crawling over the rubble up to the fourth floor. And then it took us, I think, over an hour to break down the front door before we were able to get into the into the flat. And when we got into that flat, it just looked like a bomb had gone off in there. Everything was broken. There was glass everywhere. All of the furniture had been destroyed. The the wardrobes had, you know, tipped over. And we just knew that there were three cats in this apartment, but we couldn't find them. They were obviously terrified and hiding. Eventually, we found them. Two of them had actually burrowed into the sofas, and we needed to tear the fabric of the sofa apart in order to get to them. And at that point, they had been in their apartment for 14 days uh, and were still alive. And fortunately, they didn't have they were uninjured. Uh, but they were obviously starving uh, and incredibly thirsty. So we were able to quickly feed them and give them water. And we got, um, we heard from the people that have adopted them and they're doing really great. So um, that's just one of the many, you know, and it's not just cats. We, we rescued fish, we rescued birds, we rescued dogs. Uh, There's so many animals there that, um, that were really in, in desperate situation and, and, 
needed help. Tell me about the the numbers because after um after a couple months it it had to be in the hundreds. But mm-hmm. what wh- wh- what is the count so far as we speak in in April? It's over over three hundred animals that we have physically taken out that have either had you know as I said broken limbs, other injuries, diseases. Um, and we have taken them to vets and we've been working with vets in order to treat them. A lot of the treatments that they've had to receive are quite complicated. Um, co- they've had a complex injuries, you know, the, the number of animals that we've been feeding is um, in, in the hundreds as well. So, um, yes, it's a lot, but, um, the need is so great. Yeah. And, and still, I mean, like we're talking about some things that you, you did early on, um, mm-hmm. you know, when, when the earthquake hit. Uh, how soon after the earthquake was PETA able to go into Turkey and Syria? Oh, we were there within two days. Uh, within two days, we were we were in Turkey and, and we were there for a month. Um, and as I said, we're still working with uh, the vets and with other organizations that we're able to support with the medical treatment for the animals and also with providing um, sterilization for animals in Antakya and then and food. Um, that's being delivered there as well. But yeah, it, it's a, it's been a long, it's been a long journey. I mean, the, the very first dog that we rescued Tarkin, um, we found him all alone and so sad in this area that had been evacuated in Marash, one of the worst affected cities. We thought that he was paralyzed because he wouldn't move, but I think he was just really sad. I think he had given up. Um, and when we got him to the vet, we found out that actually one of his legs was broken, but he wasn't paralyzed um, he was operated on and he has had to spend weeks at the clinic uh, recovering. But just last week, he was adopted finally. Um, wow. So he's now in his new home. I know it's so great because the, the change in him from when we first got him to now last week when he's been adopted by his new family is just incredible. He's so full of love. and They're just going to have so much joy in their life because of him. Could you imagine what he might have gone through in order oh. to survive? I mean, it's just incredible i mean i just remember remember the pictures of you know like you know the first week of the earthquake and then suddenly you don't see anything or don't hear anything about the earthquake and yet you know that there are these dogs like this this guy that you mm-hmm. just described trying to survive and mm-hmm. he's found yeah and you know in the first couple of weeks, we were just seeing constantly so many animals with, you know, limping through the streets with broken legs, desperately searching for food. Many of them with really other hideously painful injuries where probably, you know, parts, parts of buildings had collapsed on them and they had big open wounds. And um, and it wasn't just the physical injuries because you could see in their faces and in their eyes the emotional trauma that they've experienced because just like the humans that went through it, it's uh, they've watched their whole worlds fall apart and collapse. Many of them are companion animals that are wondering now where their families are. You know, they're not just hurt, but they're terrified. They're lonely. It's been great to be able to at least help some of them. Um, but there's, yeah, there's still so much need. How about when you were out there, um, did you happen to sometimes find people who needed help and needed rescue your, your effort to help rescue them? There are so many uh, groups there helping people and the police and the military are amazing. So whenever we're in whatever area we were, there was always a, a lot of support for, for people there. And, um, and if anything, it was, you know, the police and the military and, and people, you know, um, regular citizens were coming up to us saying, please, there's this cat on the third floor, or please, there's this dog in an abandoned building. So we were actually being asked by the rescue workers um, who were there to help people if, you know, if we could help the animals. So people who, you know, Turkish people who had lost their homes and were there living in tents and really had nothing at all, kept always, you know, trying to stop us offering us tea or coffee or something to eat. You know, there's the sense of um, camaraderie there is really quite special. Um, And so, the need for people was really for us to help them help their animals. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because you're right. The, the first respondents would be going after the, the people to help the people, but who mm-hmm. goes after the animals? Mm-hmm. 
And, uh, you know, and it really is helping the people as well, because like I said, there's been so many stories now of us being able to reunite um, humans with their companion animals and they've lost everything. And, and, but for them, those animals are their family. Of course, you know, many of us share our, our lives and our homes with animals and we know, you know, they're, they are part of the family and um, the idea that you wouldn't know where they are or what's happened to them or that they, the thought of them being alone on the streets or hurt or scared, you know, and that's traumatic for the people there too. So being able to bring them back together has been a real privilege. Yet at the same time, you know, it shows where the priority was. Well, the priority should always be toward the humans, but there was, how many people were out there helping the animals besides PETA? You know, at the beginning, it was very chaotic. We were he- hearing reports. There were other um, people there helping as well who were also sometimes hearing the same reports. You'd end up you know, getting misinformation because you, you would hear that there's a cat trapped in this building. And then, you know, somebody had already been there to help them out, which was great. Um, but there were there there were other people there also trying to help. But there was a real um, struggle to get information in real time. And, um, uh, I think that was, that was one of the real challenging parts at the beginning, but like I said, the police and the military, especially were really welcoming of us. And really one of the, one of the cats that we were able to trap that we had spent three days trying to catch because she was so scared. Um, when we had been notified of her by, um, one of the military men who was working in Antakya at the time. And um, he was desperate for us to get her. And then when we finally did, he took her and he adopted her and he's been sending us <laughs> pictures. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, the, the the military and the police have been really incredible in, in supporting us to support the, the animals of Turkey and, and reunite them with their families. Well, well, tell me how many of you were there uh, out there helping <laughs> these animals? It was just Mimi and... and... <laughs> No, it wasn't just me. Um, there was four of us. Um, just four. There All were of four you? of us. Yeah, that's that's um, not many. That's not many. <laughs> I mean, you got an earthquake that has toppled or this you know crippled these two countries, and they're just mm-hmm. four. That's that's like a really uh, that's like a gorilla unit out there trying to save animals. <laughs> yeah, uh, there were, but you know, we um, like I said, we just we didn't stop. We were working from the moment the sun rose until well after it fell, and uh, we had two vans and we were able to put a lot of animals into both of those vans. And, you know, it's been a, quite a, a mammoth logistical task of trying to get the animals out of the earthquake zone. Where can we take them to that's going to be safe? Because, you know, even though we were working with them um, with the, the clinic in Adana, which was a couple of hours drive, that was also a city that had been affected. And um, many of the people that worked in the vet clinic were actually sleeping in tents because their buildings were unsafe and they were still you know, there at midnight waiting for us to get there to help the animals, even though they were, you know, going through a lot of trauma themselves and not able to go home. A lot of people were, you know, and continue to be, to be helping. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just four of you guys from PETA, did mm-hmm. people know PETA? Did people say, Oh, you're PETA. We know PETA. Uh, mm-hmm. we'll, you know, we'll hear, here's some animals or, I mean, did they did they recognize um, that PETA does this sort of thing? Uh, they were, you know, they were, yes, they were very, very happy to see us there. They were very happy for the support. Um, they, as I said, it's a country that really loves animals and um, especially the cats and dogs. They were um, their beloved and uh, members of the family. So they were very, very happy to see us there and trying to help us to, uh, do as much as we can to help as many animals in those areas. Yeah. Did you have like a, uh, like a PETA t-shirt or a red cross mm-hmm. or did you have like wear yeah. yellow? Or like- we had our, we had our, our PETA shirts and our PETA rescue team jackets and our hard hats. And we had, you know, PETA emblazoned on our cars. So th- we were getting flagged down all the time, you know, wherever we were, wherever we were, people were trying to flag us down to say, please, please, we, we need you. There's a, our dog has been trapped upstairs for, you know, eight days, like, please help us. And, um, and, and we did. And and that's sort of the positive thing, people flagging you down because they, mm-hmm. they need your help, but there's also a, an element of danger here. 
And mm-hmm. tell me about uh, were people flagging you down for the wrong reasons? You know, what are you guys doing here? Hey, Peter, you don't know who Peter is. I mean, tell me about the danger about, about going <laughs> into this situation. And maybe even were there some political dangers uh, when you went into Syria? We haven't physically been into Syria yet. We're working on that. We're working on getting visas and able to be able to go. But we uh, have been supporting groups in Syria with provisions, and we're hopeful that we'll be able to get there soon. In Turkey, the dangers were really much more physical dangers than anything. You know, even though the the first earthquake was obviously the biggest, there have been many earthquakes since. The buildings that are still standing, as I said, they're very dangerous buildings. They're they're unsafe to go into. The structures are still falling down. I think the biggest fear was really just that, this, the going into the buildings that were very, very unstable. Um, th- there were times when the military were not allowing us to go into the buildings. You know, we, we were sometimes sneaking around and waiting for the military to leave before we would go into the buildings because they had told us that we couldn't go in. There were animals in there that needed to get out. And if we didn't go in, they were going to die in there. So it didn't really feel like much of a choice. Yeah. Was there any kind of politics that came up? I mean, Turkey, I mean, you're, you're PETA UK, but did people see mm-hmm. PETA as PETA US or uh, did, was that even relevant uh, when the need was all around? No, it wasn't relevant. Honestly, um, everybody, we didn't have the, the only issues that we had were sometimes with the police and the military that didn't want us to go into areas that were very dangerous. And, um, but other than that, we only received just support. Um, everybody who was there was trying to, as I said, feed us, give us tea, um, look after us. They were really grateful that we had come to help them. And, um, I don't think anybody cared about nationalities at that point. It was just, we were all humans. We were all animals and everybody was in it together, really. Yeah. And that's, and that's great to hear. And it's great also to see that PETA was recognized as the people who could come in and save, uh, these animals that were, were out there. Uh, tell me more about just say how your, your day began or how your day begins uh, in terms of. You're there in Turkey. Mm-hmm. It would seem to me that just all, all you have to do is look look around and there's probably something or someone or an animal to save. But did mm-hmm. you get tips? Did people call you? Did you uh, how, mm-hmm. how, how did a typical typical day start? We were getting tips all the time. There were a lot of groups on social media set up where people were tr- giving information about their animals. So s- some people who had, you know, suffered through the earthquake and were in hospital and desperate for somebody to go to their place to try to find their animals, to make sure that they were, you know, to see if they were okay, if they were still alive. There were other instances where people had had to flee, where animals had been lost and they were desperate to find them. So there was a, there's a lot, and there still is a lot of information of missing animals, animal, and, and at the time, you know, addresses of where animals were trapped. So we would start our day with, you know, getting into the car, crack of dawn, driving to whichever city it was that day, Albastan, Antakya, Marash. Um, and um, by the time we got there, we had pinned, sorted out our, our day of where we were going, which, which apartment buildings we were going to. And then, you know, Things happened along the way, of course, because we were coming across animals where we'd have to stop. We'd see animals on the street and one of them was dragging, you know, like one cat, Talia, that I remember who was dragging herself across the street. And um, she was just, it was like she had flagged us down, really. She was, she had made a stop and um, we, you know, we scooped her up. She was so happy um, for us to be there. And then it turns out she had a broken pelvis and she's one of the ones that we had operated and she's been rehomed and she's really happy. But so for for situations like that, we were constantly having to stop as well because there were animals that were uh, injured or had broken limbs that we were picking up along the way. And then, um, and for the first couple of weeks, it was really responding to the, the animals that were in the most danger, which is the animals that were trapped in the buildings with no way of getting out. Hey, tell me about lucky, the cat Lucky. lucky. Do you recall? Lucky. I do. I do recall. A little cat. Uh, A little cat. Yeah. Yeah. She, um, (laughs) so as I said, it's chaos. There's bulldozers everywhere. There's dust everywhere. There's so much noise. And um, we were, it was towards the end of our day. We were in Antakya and um, 
we were heading back to to the vet clinic in Adana. We had the car loaded with animals um, that needed help. And um, she darted in front of our car. And, you know, from nowhere, she darted in front of the car. So obviously we slammed on the brakes and then we we got out and um, uh, picked her up. I mean, she, she was another one that was so, you know, jumped into our arms, basically, like couldn't wait, it was basically saying, like, get me out of here. Um, and so we, we did. Of course, she came with us uh, and we called her lucky because, you know, she escaped death more than once that day. So. <laughs> Describe lucky. Oh, she's just such a little sweetheart. I mean, um, like you said, she's small. She's um, she's very young and so affectionate and so adorable and so much personality. She's just lovely. Yeah. What happened? Not, to her? not so bright to jump in front of a car or maybe she was, you know, because that's actually what got her what got her out of there. So um, so she is one of the animals that has um, was rehomed in Istanbul. Mm. So we were working with a shelter in Izmir um, and also um, vegan advocacy groups in Istanbul and Ankara, who we have been working with in order to rehome animals and also with the vets in in Adana, um, but she was one that went to Istanbul. Yeah. Now there's a picture of a cat, like a, a little, like a, 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 a sort of orange tabby that, mm-hmm. uh, you, you, you know, she's just you know, eating out of a can. And do you remember her? Do you remember? I think, I, well, I mean, there's so there's, uh, <laughs> there's more than a couple uh, tabby cats, but I think that that's Talia, who I was telling you has oh. the broken pelvis. Um, and um, uh, she's, yes, she's doing great. She has a, a new family. She has a brother. We were sent a video of her last week where she's running around uh, her new home, chasing her brother. Uh, and she just looks so happy. So, yeah. Now there's another cat. I'm just, going over the cats that you've <laughs> talked about that, that the rescue team has talked about in the last few weeks, uh-huh. the cat named Pisa. Do you recall? Oh Pisa? yeah. Yeah. Pisa lives in, in Virginia now. Uh, wow. An American. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, we called her Pisa because she was rescued from a building that was, you know, oh, slanted sideways, uh, the leaning, <laughs> uh, like the leaning, leaning tower. tower. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, uh, one of uh, one of our team who had come over from the U.S., um, Alex, actually couldn't uh, couldn't stand to to be parted from her, and she made the trip back from from Turkey all the way to the U.S. and now is living her best life in in Virginia. Wow! And and you know those now recounting these stories, they mm-hmm. they they help. They lift you. They lift one spirits about the terrible disaster there that continues to happen, but. They're helpful Mm -hmm. to talk about these things. They're not all happy stories. There was a lot of, you know, animals that we weren't able to, to save that were too far gone. And the kindest thing in the, for them was to help end their suffering humanely. Um, You know, some, the the tragedy of just the, the, the scale of the suffering, but yes, those stories where, you know, we got to know these animals, each, each one of them, they all have their own personalities. They're all, you know, either shy or feisty or playful or every one of them an individual and every one of them deserving of a, you know, um, of a, of a happy life. And so being able to like with Pisa and with Lucky and Talia, being able to know that they're, that they're okay after the trauma that they've been through, um, is, it feels really good. Yeah. And, you know, we talked earlier about right now it's, cats are in heat and Mm -hmm. and the fact i i was when you said that i was still shocked that number one they survived all these months and Mm -hmm. to to be able to be you know you know the thinking about having babies and then Mm -hmm. now they're they're forced to try to find a place to have a safe place to have their babies and look at the choices they have you know, mm-hmm. they rubble and better rubble and not as good mm-hmm. rubble. And, mm-hmm. and for all the survival skills to get them this far, they're still in danger. I mean, yes, that's, that's a trick. They are, they are, they're, they are in danger. And, you know, we're doing as much as we can to 
sterilize as many as we can. A lot of those animals are, they were animals that, who were living on the streets before, uh, and it was already incredibly hard, a, a very hard life. Uh, now it's much, much harder. Um, but we're working with partner vets to sterilize animals, to provide food and water. Um, and for the animals that are companion animals who are, there are, there are still many also companion animals, um, cats that are beloved family members that are still being found to this day. But yes, again, with them, it's really the desperate race against the clock to have them sterilized before they, um, before they give birth, because it is not a good place to have to, you know, for them to be giving birth. And it's also the stress on their bodies of, of pregnancy, of having to nurse their young in that situation as well is just really, really bad for them. Um, so still a lot of work to be done and, and, and we need a lot of support with that too. So I hope that people are, even though Turkey and Syria is not necessarily on the news anymore, um, or in our social media feeds, the suffering is still really intense and there's still a lot that needs to be done there. So I hope people continue to support the work. Well, it's being supported by PETA's Global Compassion Fund, which uh, yes. relies on donations from from people everywhere. And without the Global yeah. Compassion Fund, it would be very difficult to do things like rent a crane to help mm -hmm. uh, rescue uh, a companion animal from a dilapidated building. But mm -hmm. when, when are you planning to go back? I know you're doing other things, but when are you going to lead mm -hmm. another team to go back and another effort? We, we don't have anything set at the moment, but um, I'm speaking with our vets on, on a at least daily basis with um, updates on how all of our animals are doing. You know, as I said, we've got almost a hundred animals at the moment in the vets that are still um, being operated on that are being treated for quite serious infections and diseases um, we need to have those animals adopted out so that we can create more space in order to be able to bring more animals into the clinics. You know, that's, that's one of the, the, the big problems there is that there's so many animals in need and there's not a lot of space. There's not a lot of places for them to go. You know, the sanctuaries are full up. Um, and, uh, so we are really working hard to get as many of those animals adopted as we can, as quickly as we can, so that we can help more. Um, and that's why it's so important to sterilize because, you know, there, there are too many animals. There are far too many animals at the moment that need help. And, you know, more of them being born just makes it impossible. Well, well Mimi Bekshi, and uh, what is your official title now? Because I don't want to demote you by, by saying... <laughs> I'm vice president of UK, Europe, and Australia. Of course. Of course you are. Of course you are. But now, and being vice president, I know you can't, like, you can't stop for a minute to do anything, anything else but save an animal. But in those weak moments when you think, I've got to give up, uh, you know, this is so daunting, I, I, I can't. Is there an animal that you encountered uh, in Turkey? That makes you think, no, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't stop. I, I have to. Yes. Yes. Actually there, there are several, but one, um, uh, Judy, who is a German shepherd, um, uh, mix that we found on the street and somebody had obviously a kind person had tried to help her. Her leg was very badly injured and they had wrapped, um, a scarf around her leg, but that had was you know, really gross, pussy, disgusting, and it had created a lot of um, uh, infection in the wound. So uh, initially we thought that her leg was going to have to be amputated, but she spent uh, a month getting treatment every day for her leg. And now she's doing great. And she's just, I, there's just something in her eyes. She's, she's just such a joy to be around and you can just see how, um, how grateful she is and how kind she is and how sweet she is. And I actually have her as a screensaver on my phone. I, th I think about her every day. Um, and you know, I just love her and, and, but all of them, you know, there's not a single, one, all of the animals that we've taken, um, and that we've helped have been just their own unique, special little souls. I think about them all every day, really. And a screensaver of Judy. Mm-hmm. 
Well, yeah, we're, 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 we're going to keep going for Judy. We're going to keep going. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Mimi Bakshi, thank you very much for joining us on the PETA podcast. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's fun talking to you. And I can, I can see just by mentioning Judy and the others, you get a little, little emotional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a very emotional situation, you know, it's so, it's, uh, it's really hard to even try to explain the trauma of like what they've gone through of seeing a country that's been totally destroyed of, you know, um, the suffering on the scale it, that it's, they're experiencing. It's really difficult. Yeah. Well, uh, Mimi, thank you really for your time and for telling the stories of Judy and the others. And mm -hmm. thank goodness you got a dog in there. Cause we heard so, so many cats. <laughs> The dog people were saying, wait, there had to be some dogs you saved. <laughs> Tarkan as well. Our gorgeous well, actually, we saved a lot of dogs, but um, yeah. Tarkan? More cat. Tarkan? Mm-hmm. That was his name? That was his name. Yeah, we called him after Tarkan, the Turkish singer. Everybody knows, you know, that song, like, Kiss Kiss. <laughs> oh, no. I, <laughs> Tarkan. Well, tell me about Tarkan while we have you. Well, Tarkin was one I, I I told you about who we found who had we thought was paralyzed. Oh, that but, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And he and uh, and he's been adopted now. Last week, after being at the vet for weeks from the recovering from his surgery from his broken leg, um, and he's just yeah. I mean, special, special. You can make it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he did. He, he's in. He has a new family in Adena, which oh, is where right. our vet is and where he was being treated for weeks. So uh, he didn't have to go far, which is great. Um, right. And hopefully, we'll see. We'll definitely be seeing him again the next time we're there. We'll go visit him. Well, when you go back, uh, let us know, and we'll talk to you again, and just great. get an update on on the situation there. And uh, really, uh, thanks for, for telling us the stories about all these animals that you helped there in Turkey. Thank you. Thanks so much. Mimi Bakshi, Vice President of PETA UK, Europe and Australia, on the month-long effort in Turkey to save animals after the earthquake of February 6, 2023 the deadliest earthquake in Turkey since 526 and the deadliest in Syria in 200 years. We'll be following what Bekshi does in the future as she returns to Turkey and her efforts to get into Syria. The rescue effort, by the way, made possible by your generous donations to the PETA Global Compassion Fund. For updates, go to PETA.org. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. You can contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at AMOK.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's A-A-L-D-E-F.org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.